welcome to see you here. Uh, is everybody having a good time? Great. Um, just wanted to give you a heads up about if you're here for CEO credit, you scan your badge at the end of the presentation, it's in the back. Um, so if you have a CEO or if you're a member of that SIA, they automatically send you your documentation to CEO credit. Uh, I want to introduce our Stephen is a primary API federal systems architect. He joined uh, No Name at Akamai in June 2024 from F5, where he led Army and other federal engagement. He has decades of hardware and software expertise and numerous certifications. Uh, he served as an Army contractor and worked at numerous AORs. So welcome, Stephen. second day with a little bit of API knowledge. So, um, we'll start out, uh, this is going to be a workshop type environment. Um, it's going to be a little bit different, right? It's not, the format because of the speaking here is um, going to be a little bit different than what you would experience if you were to contact me and ask me to set up a workshop for you. The workshops are intended to be highly interactive to give you the opportunity within the environment and experience um, an API security tree set for yourself, right? Today it'll be all instructor-led, obviously, uh, with a briefing beforehand about APIs, what they are, and uh, you know, why you should care about protecting them. So the agenda today, what are APIs? Right? The problem they present, the threat landscape, uh, why target APIs, how to protect the API and the elements of a good API tool set. Then we'll jump into the workshop, and I promise I'll leave room for some questions uh, and all of that uh, at the end. Um, so, let's jump into that. So, what is an API? Um, how many people here have worked with API in the past or have passing familiarity with them? Good, good. So, you know, API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's been around for a very, very long time. When I started my career, software engineer in the late 90s. APIs were around back then. Uh, they looked vastly different <laughs> than they do today, and they were not as easy to play with. But essentially, you can think of an API as a set of protocols or rules for an application to be able to talk to another application and use the services and data uh, provided there. So what that allows you to do and why that's super important is because uh, it used to be when we built applications to run, we built them monolithic meant that if you needed to have a database and, let's say, a map system or something like that in your application, you had to build all that from scratch and it had to exist within your application. And then if you built another application, you had to rebuild all that again. Now, maybe you copy and paste each other, right? So we did that. But, um, you know, you didn't have the capability to pull from code you had already written in applications you already had. Well, APIs can let you do that. So that's the difference between modern apps. Um, and this is a uh, API definition. Right? So APIs can be very, very small, a few lines of code. Right? Um, and it's important to see this because um, you know, it's deceptively easy. APIs are deceptively easy to generate, deceptively easy to use, right? To pull that information. Now, how many people here got here today using something like Uber or Lyft or something like that? I know I didn't. Pull up your cell phone, punch up Uber, Uber comes up and says, I want to go to point A. Right? In this case, I want to go from my hotel to the Hawaii Convention Center uh, where I can get my API around. Right? Um, so it's important to understand when you do that, that Uber app is calling hundreds and hundreds of APIs in the back end. So for instance, the Uber app didn't reinvent the wheel when it came to GPS, right? it didn't reinvent the wheel when it came to Maps, it calls out to Google Maps, of course, that, right? That's all API calls. It calls out to Google databases to figure out who's online, right? Which drivers are online, which drivers are working right now, which one's the closest to you. All that happens in API calls, hundreds of them. And most of those are in the clear, right? So this is what 
a definition of that might look like. And why is it a problem? Why are APIs? So we know what APIs are. We understand the basic fundamentals of why they exist. But why are they a problem? The reason that they're a problem is due to the nature in which they can be used. So, um, like I just said, right? Uber didn't reinvent trying to figure out maps. There's Google Maps out there. But Uber is not the only application using Google Maps. In fact, most modern applications that need some sort of map use Google Maps or some sort of map out there already. And they're being developed every day by thousands and thousands of people every day. So APIs are growing exponentially. And they are quite literally everywhere. And in my talks with um, different personnel, whether it be uh, actually military nature personnel or civilian, or just um, other DOD contractors, there's a misnomer that um, a lot of my DevOps, right? I have nothing to do with applications. I don't even run applications, right? I just deal with networks, okay? I just have a bunch of switches, routers, firewalls, right? So I don't even worry about APIs, right? That's not true, right? Again, most of those devices, regardless of what they are, are using APIs in the back end to control some aspect of what they're doing. Which, again, means APIs are literally everywhere in the environment. And for most people, there's not really a great grasp on how to determine where they are, right? So when you know, I mean, when you buy a COTS, a commercial off-the-shelf piece of software, those commercial off-the-shelf pieces of software might actually have some documentation in them, if you're lucky, to say, these are the APIs we're using. How many people think that that's all the APIs are using? Right. They probably don't even have a great idea themselves. Now, they know what APIs they create and that they need to make their product do what it does. But again, a lot of people are using open source libraries in their documentation and in their code, right? That could be using any number of APIs in their company, right? So wrapping your head around where are my APIs, how do I deal with them, is very much the first step in being able to tackle this, okay? Um, and what we are seeing when we come into these environments we come in, we talk with our customers, and we're trying to fill out holistic solution approaches. And we get to APIs, and we say, well, how many APIs do you have? Well, I know exactly how many APIs. From my COTS, I have this many APIs, let's say 50. And from everything that I've created, I know exactly what it is. I have an additional 35. So I've got 85 APIs. What we are finding is when we do our discovery, we are seeing at least two types. Sometimes, in the worst case I've seen, order of magnitude for APIs than they initially thought they had. Um, and these represent rogue well, shadow APIs that you don't have any idea exist in your environment. By the way, they don't just exist in one airplane. You can't just say, well, this is my application, this is my application segmentation of my architecture. So I know this is where all my APIs are. Absolutely not. They exist at every layer of your architecture. And we'll talk about why that's important here in a minute. However, as you can see here, there's a report, Hackers Reach at and This was a misuse of an API that led to this attack. In 2021, Gartner issued a report that said by 2023, APIs could very well be the number one attack factor out there in cybersecurity. Now, here in 2024, the proliferation of all the applications we use on a daily basis for literally every part of our life, I think you'd be hard pressed to argue that point that APIs are for sure the number one attack vector. But why? I mean, why target APIs? Why is why has it become such a large attack vector? Well, number one, they're everywhere. But who cares, right? There are a lot of things are everywhere. Why is a why are APIs being targeted? Well, a simple reason APIs are being targeted because of a couple of things, right? Data access and perceived simplicity of APIs, right? So using APIs are very simplistic in a lot of ways. In fact, most APIs today take the form of a web method of some kind, right? HTTPS, right? Post it, delete. How many people have heard these words before, right? Okay? So all applications use these things, right? Now, hopefully, not many of your applications are using delete. That can be a very bad thing that leads to very bad problems. But Posting get most common access. So it's very simple to use, it's very simple to use. And they often have 
direct access to back end data applications, right? Meaning, if I can get something out of your API that you didn't necessarily expect, I might get a lot of data out of you that you might not want to link out, right? So again, this is why the API is so incredible. Not only are they heavy, it's simple to use, but they often lead to direct access to data and services, okay? So let's think about another one, right? How many people go online, let's say, well, Amazon is low hanging fruit, right? Let's pick one that most people don't use anymore, it's not eBay or something like that. How many people though go on to some sort of marketplace and put a bunch of stuff in your cart and then go to your cart and you know, check out, pay with a credit card or something like that, have it mailed to your house? I mean, it's super convenient, right? Everybody does that. Um, I bet I have on the order of one or two packages a day delivered to my house in that manner, right? Um, well, that's another aspect here. So let's say you can get into that cart now, right? And it'll take $80, you have yeah, four items, 80 bucks, right? And you're thinking to yourself, huh, I wonder if I can use this cart API and manipulate it a little bit. And maybe I get this stuff for free. Or maybe I get it for less than free and they ship me this product and I actually get money put on a credit card. That'd be amazing, right? Well, that's another way, right? So it's not just data access that they're after, they're after services, it's service access. And a lot of times, the way that you would address those things is very similar, if not exactly the same. So how do we protect against something like that? Well, there's pillars here. And at Akamai, um, with our API uh, platform, we identify everything by these pillars. So there's discovery, Discovery is knowing what is out there. Right? You cannot protect something you do not know exists. Right? So how do we discover APIs? So that's a massive tenet of protecting them. Let's discover all of your APIs and where they exist and then create an inventory of them so that we can figure out what we need to protect. Then there's posture management. Posture management is policy. Right? Developing policies and developing the way that you can talk to these APIs you just discovered and keeping that very regulated so that you know that there's a minimal chance of misuse of the APIs, okay? Then there's runtime protection. So when something is actually happening, traffic is flowing across your network, they are using your APIs, right? But they might not be using them the way that you thought they should, and so you need to have that runtime protection, that ability to say, hey, uh, we're seeing a lot of these different incidences, and we're pretty sure they're attacks, how do I go ahead and start blocking that attack right now, today? And then of course there's active testing. So, testing phase. So how do I stop the APIs from even making their way into production? This, this piece, the testing piece, is working this in your CICD pipeline, making sure that as you develop tools and code that is being tested rigorously to make sure that your APIs that are being developed to support those applications do not have holes in them prior to Push okay, so these, these are the, the, the tenets of how you protect um, your API. And then of course, the elements of a good API tool is that take all of those uh, different factors, right, the different pillars, the discovery, configuration, one time, the testing, uh, and then augment it with what's only, right, your shared services, things like administration, authentication, right, so think single sign-on things and stuff like that. So, you know, when we're looking at how do I protect my APIs? And trust me, there's a number of vendors out there that are offering these services. You need to be asking yourself, okay, do they do discovery, configuration, runtime, and testing? And do they already work with what I have in the place? Right? So it's not going to do you any good to protect your APIs if you have to upend your entire infrastructure to do so, right? The other thing you need to ask yourself is how is this being done, right? There's two ways to do that. There's active and passive. So I think active as in actively scanning my network settings, constantly scanning, constantly looking for these things. Right? Passive is off to the side, out of band. Right? Um, and then what do they integrate with, right? So again, the idea here is that you're going to want to protect all of your APIs and the the existing infrastructure, which means a good tool set is going to offer you the ability to integrate with things uh, like network taps or routers, firewalls, also API gateways, right? That's a little bit true, obviously. <laughs> um, then you have uh, things like balancers, right? 
you know, the best of those. But most people are just in print, on print, right? Maybe you have some cloud uh, interaction with some AWS managers or GCP, right? You can get integrated with those functions, right? So you're looking for a platform that can integrate with many, many different uh, devices and technologies across the OSI. And then, of course, your deployment, right? It doesn't do you any good if your API platform can only exist in one of your environments. You need to be able to have an API tool set that can exist everywhere where you are in order to get a holistic picture of exactly what's going on in your API program. And then, you can have that. Okay? With that being said, that's kind of the primer of what we're going to be talking about today in the workshop. So we'll jump straight into the workshop here.
inside of most modern browsers, this one being Chrome, there's something called developer tools. How many people have heard of developer tools or work with developer tools? Awesome, good, there's some familiarity here. But for those of you that haven't, um, usually F12 uh, will bring up developer tools. And developer tools look like this, and you'll notice that being one, I'm working on such a small screen, and my eyes are so bad, I apologize, that uh, it pushed the website all the way over and you can barely see my amazing brand of game. Um, however, uh, this is what developer tools look like. And in, for instances of this particular workshop, we're going to focus solely on the network tab uh, and this fetch slash hxhr. And you'll notice it's relatively clean here. There's, there's nothing up there. However, if I were to go to something like a shop, you'll notice things start to pop in, right? I have something called products here, okay? And if I click on products, I get a lot of information about this is where the Mercado case begins. This requested URL right here is known as an API endpoint. Okay? So I've discovered an API endpoint. I've also discovered the method used by the application. It's a good method. Um, I have a trip 200. And I understand some information about the remote address here. Okay? I also know what types of headers I can fill with this thing uh, to get valid information out okay? If I also click past the headers to the response, I can actually see the responses that these APIs are sending back to me, okay? So in this particular case, just a little bit of information about the product we offer. Um, you can't really see the chair over here, but there's um, obviously a missing uh, chair. Yeah. There's also this entire GPI. Um, and I have, because I have a Lamborghini, my available balance is gigantic up there. But I don't, I think that's like a billion dollars I have to spend on this Lamborghini. However, uh, I also see here in the responses, I have products, product IDs, um, descriptions, prices, so on and so forth. And I can actually come down here and buy these things if I wish to. Um, order successful, great. Um, and now, uh, you can see I've generated a bunch of other interesting information down here from the, from the endpoints. And I can kind of see some more information about what's happening on the back end here. So if I'm a bad actor, I'm going to start here. I'm going to start going through every single tab of this uh, <laughs> application. And I'm going to write down a bunch of information and about, about it and figure out what I might be able to uh, do to come up to issues. Okay. If I click on the community tab, I'm going to start getting some more information. And here, this is simply a form. Okay. Um, it's just a forum where people talk about their cars and things that they are doing. Um, for the purposes of this workshop, um, they are talking in Latin uh, for some reason. And in any case, you'll see I've actually made a post. My post was TechNet in Impact here. Okay? But, just like anything else, this is generated via API. If I look at it, Again, I can collect some information. Here's my API endpoint. Here's my methods, right? Here's the responses here. Okay, so every time a post is made, there are responses to it. And we can take a look at some of these things, right? We have an ID associated with the response, we have a title, we have a content, we have the authors and the names. But then you'll start noticing things like nickname, email ID, um, vehicle ID, things here that don't show up on the web page. Huh. I wonder why that is. What could cause something like that to happen? Well, how many people here have made web applications before? Right? Most web applications have a back end of some kind, usually a database they pull from. And CI CD being an agile being as, as uh, repetitive as it is and as quickly as it is, sometimes we do things as developers test our code. Things that are not intended to make it to production. Things like select asterisk from. Whoever's, who's done select asterisk from to test out their application before? Nobody? Really? I know I still do it a lot to test the application, right? And then the intent always is, ah, you know what, I'm going to select asterisk from over here just to see if it works. But I'm going to go back, it looks like I promise, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to select only the things I need before this thing goes to production. Um, but things moving as 
fast as they do, sometimes that doesn't happen, and you get what's called leaky APIs like you have here. Okay? So if I'm a bad actor, I've just seen an instance of leaky API. Now, I wonder what I can do with that. Hmm, I don't know. Well, let's see. How many people have heard of something called Postman? Okay. And what is Postman? Sir, do you know what Postman is? Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's just an application that allows you to uh, automate the use of um, API calls, JSON calls, uh, different types of calls. In this particular instance, we're going to be using it to make it easy to do things that we could otherwise do with curl commands or something like that. Right? Um, again, just, just uh, different web method calls. So uh, I actually have an environment that I set up because I do quite a lot of these. Um, where I essentially just give um, some of these variables a value. Um, you'll notice that uh, this particular one has a tnip dash uh, workshop. Uh, that is literally uh, just this base uh, FQDN loaded in there so that I don't have to type it up every single time. Um, and then uh, I have my token IDs used for logging in. Uh, along with my not real um, username and my incredibly secure uh, password. Um, but you know, one of the things I do here just to test this out is, is try the login page. Again, this right here is taken directly from my header information that I stripped out previously in my reconnaissance. And if I send a post to that, you'll notice that I get a bearer token back. And I, this is how I use it to, to take that bearer token and turn it into my Google variables so that I can then make posts and all kinds of things. But that's not really what we're interested in today. Today, what we're going to be doing is seeing how I might be able to take uh, advantage of a leaky API um, and essentially looking at that um, API endpoint here. So this, again, is just that baseline uh, FQDN. You know, this says community API v2 community post recent. Again, that is taken directly out of here. It is this request URL. Um, and it is a git method. So again, in postman, I'm saying git, go here, do these things. If I say send, you'll see that I get essentially the same response, right? But the cool thing about this is that because I have a link, um, somebody might be able to come in here and take my vehicle ID and do something like that. Well, I mean, obviously, I should have access to where my vehicle ID is. Right? That's a no-brainer. I'm me. Right? But I am not Brandon Strike here. But I wonder if I were to take his vehicle So, if I come up here and I simply change their endpoint vehicle ID here, again, I'm Steven Rand. <laughs> I'm not Brandon. I should not have access to this. Yet, it is giving me Brandon's vehicle ID and its exact location. Now, Brandon, listen, if I didn't have a Lamborghini and Brandon had a little mini car, I could go take that car. I have a Lamborghini. I'm not going to take that car. I'm just saying that in most instances, when I do this, I don't get the Lamborghini. Right? I get a Hyundai. Not that there's anything wrong with a Hyundai, but perhaps if I had, if this was a BMW, I'd be like, hey, maybe I'll move these coordinates right here and just steal this car. Again, this is an instance of gaining access to information you are not supposed to have. It is the number one API attack vector according to OWASP 6 API security top 10. It is called Broken Object Level Authorization, or OWASP. This is an instance of that, and it's incredibly simple, right? That's the whole purpose of, of this exercise, is to show you how incredibly simple it is to not just identify the APIs that your applications are using, but then to possibly misuse them. The nefarious thing here was something like this. I didn't malform any packets. I didn't issue a SQL injection. I didn't do any cross-site scripting. 
I simply used an API the way it was designed to be used, but was able to use that information for nefarious purposes. So it makes it useful. And the reason why that's important is because there is a tendency with APIs to say, oh, you know, I have an API team, you might have some protection, right? Absolutely not. It does absolutely nothing for you. Now, it is true to say that there are some API gateways that do build in API security to some extent, but an API gateway, it purpose it has absolutely nothing to do with security. It's an aggregation point, right? It makes it simple for management of APIs, right? Um, but it is not secure. But then you say, okay, well, I have a web access, I have a web application firewall, right? That's a layer seven firewall that protects me. Absolutely. It protects you against things like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, malformed packets, things like that. But when everything comes through, it's kosher. And all you're doing is misusing the information you're getting back. Your web application firewall is completely useless. So you absolutely must have some sort of tool set that can identify these things and say, hey, you know, there's something going on here. We're not exactly sure what's happening, right? But it bears resemblance to a Bola attack, and you need to take action. So what does something like that look like? Well, something like that looks like this, okay? Now, you'll notice my little uh, shirt here says Akamai. I am with Akamai. This is Akamai's API security platform. However, the badging up here says no name. And that's because they bought a company that I used to work with called No Name. So I used to be No Name. I'm now Akamai. Um, so apologies that our marketing team has not called the badge. However, that will soon say Akamai up there and not no name. So please ignore that. Pay no attention to the name that occurred to me. Um, but this is the, the platform. And as we come into this platform, you'll notice the security splash page being the first thing that happens after you log in. Um, it does tout everything we find in terms of OWASP API security top 10. And these are the top 10 attacks in order of importance. And you'll notice the first one is broken object level authorization. And we do have an incident here. So we have an incident here, and it's got a weird, almost red coloration there, uh, which, you know, anybody of you that worked in socks or not, so the fact that red means bad, the more red, the more bad, or rather the less green, the more bad. Um, and I can click on this thing and kind of see exactly what's going on. So I have an internet-facing API with broken object level organization. I can click on that and I can figure things out like, hey, what happened? Why is it a problem? What should I do? to remedy the situation. And then further, I can look at the evidence to show me exactly why it's a problem. Payloads, what was sent in, what was, what was sent out, right? These are tenants of things you should be looking for in API security platforms, right? You have to be able to see these attacks as they happen. You might be asking yourself, okay, that's all well and good, right? You can see those attacks happening and all that. But how do I know exactly what's going on in my environment? And how can I be proactive well, over here in the inventory tab, I can see in this particular workshop, being highly simplistic, I have two API hosts and 27 discovery shots. Okay. Some of them contain PII information, potential information, all kinds of bad data types. But if I wanted to see my raw API inventory, I can come over here and look at it. And these are all of the different hosts, the API endpoints, the different methods used that were discovered and all of this. Now, this particular uh, API tool set sits out of there. It is not active. We do not scan. We do not do anything like that. We are not going to make any of your isms in the app. Okay? Um, so there's no active scan. We sit off to the side and we integrate with different um, technologies in your infrastructure that pull information and we parse through that information and find your APIs. And then we use machine learning algorithms to assign pretty colors to you and little numbers that tell you how bad they are. Um, and again, you can click on them and learn more about uh, the API itself and kind of why it got the store it got and many, many of the instances you find um, there. Okay. Um, so again, this is why it's so important to understand some things when you start talking to industry professionals about your API uh, security posturing. You need to make absolutely certain that uh, they're brought in as early as possible to the infrastructure that you can 
have been discussions on exactly where you would like to do that level of integration. Um, for this particular one, uh, you will see, and I need to go to the supervisor to show you this. You will see that in this platform, we have the capability to integrate, and it's, there's actually over eight different vendors to be integrated. And you should be looking for this in any tool set, not just our tool set. So the idea here is, it's not okay to just integrate with the API gateway. Right? As I said previously, there are many, many APIs operating that have absolutely nothing to do with your application base and will not be captured by API gateways. So you'll notice things like, um, you know, AWS up there, obviously. Different API gateways, different um, load balancers, right? Um, we can even integrate things like the Gigamon tabs and stuff like that, all the way down through to things like Microsoft IIS servers, right? So the idea here is that as you're looking at these products, right, you need to not only be able to inventory, but you need to be able to inventory all areas of your infrastructure, okay? To be able to pull together a holistic inventory approach that you see here, which will allow you to uh, not just gain knowledge of the APIs the way to do that, but it also gives you uh, an ability through machine learning to build more robust algorithms that will actually more accurately tell you where your risks are and what's going on, right? So that's the one part, right? The discovery pillar, right? The posture management pillar, right? What do we do with that? So the posture management policies. Now, like any good uh, cybersecurity company, we have a ton of built-in policies right out of the box, okay? Um, obviously, you can create your own because everybody has different data running through their systems, okay? But you don't have to worry about things like um, PII information like social security information, right? Everybody knows what a social security number is, well, at least in this country, right? And you know the format of what they look like, and we all can agree that it is universally bad when social security numbers go out the clear. Right? Nobody wants their social security number out in the clear. Um, I don't know if you guys remember um, a product from maybe 20 years ago now. Um, there was a security lockdown, like LifeLock. You guys remember LifeLock? And the CEO from LifeLock was like, I'm so confident in LifeLock that I put my social security number on the back of a truck and I drove it around all these towns saying, this is my name and my social security number. And he's like, LifeLock. So confident, I'm not going to get identity theft, and then promptly got identity theft and like millions of dollars in credit. Like, we all understand it's universally bad to have our social security numbers out there, so we have a pre can policy, right? We know that already, right? You don't need to worry about that. Kind of thing, right? However, your organization might have some other kind of community in mind, right? Some other kind of community. So you can come in here and you can create policies and say, hey, if you see something that looks like this, this can be bad, right? And that's regex, right? Regex does all that pattern matching, all that kind of stuff, okay? So you can create different policies, and this is how we create our posturing system that allows our inventory to be informed by different data type tags, okay? So this is important because you need to not just know your APIs, but you need to know what kind of data is traveling back and forth in order to protect it. Then, of course, the next question is, well, <laughs> that's all great, right? You're showing me all of the different problems I've got in my environment, but you're not really helping me protect it, right? So thanks very much for a bunch of useful information that I don't have any ability to deal with. But, we come over here to the runtime tab, and I come to attackers, and what can happen here is you'll see all of the different active attacks that we are um, currently detecting. So, and you'll notice that they come in in various different forms. So, in this particular workshop, you have two predominant forms that come in at. They come in at IP level, and they come in with job trainings in this particular workshop. Those are not the only ones. Um, and then if I click on some of these things here, you'll notice all of the different attempts that were associated with these attacks. And some of them say attempted, some of them say succeeded. That's not great, right? We don't want to see them say succeeded. Um, but the reason why this is important is because the system should be able to not just see what's happening, right, but be able to coordinate this back to individual people and say, hey, listen, um, I'm seeing this one particular person in this particular case named John.Smith at Facebook.com, and he did a lot of crazy stuff, man. I'm pretty sure, since it wasn't like a one-off, this guy's trying to attack you. In fact, 
not only a preacher, I'm 99% confident that this is an attack. And that confidence score is both in the of machine learning algorithms um, that learn as we go. So obviously, the more that traffic comes through this, the more resilient they're going to be. And then you'll notice I can block this attack, um, or I can do you know any number of other things with this attack. So let me click on one again. You get the same type of information here. What happened? Why is it important that that happen? How do I fix the problem? You get all of the evidence. I can block the attack, or I can take some level of other action. Now, this is why this is important, right? Because when you start talking about things like runtime protection, yeah, I can block them, but that doesn't do me a lot of good, right? Yeah, it stops him, right? It doesn't stop anything else from coming through, right? So what I need to be able to do is integrate with other systems in your environment that allow your DevOps team to correct the problem, right? So in this particular way, I can integrate with any number of different um, systems on the back end to show you what that looks like. In this particular demo, all I have set up right now is email how to enter. If I come into my workflow of integrations, I can integrate with things like Slack or Jira or ServiceNow or Syslog or CloudWatch or Splunk or what have you, or any number of them. And I can create things like automatically with tickets. Now when I do that, what's super cool about that is not only can I do that manually by coming down here, clicking on the attack, and then taking some level of action with it, right? I can come over here and say, create a Jira ticket. All of the evidence for exactly what happened automatically gets attached to that ticket, which is super cool, right? Because then what you can do is you're sending a ticket with all this information to the DevOps people saying, hey man, we saw this attack, not great. By the way, this is what happened in case you wanted to play it. But also, this is exactly how you fix the problem. So please go ahead and check the API. Um, and that way we don't have to worry about this happening ever again. The other thing that's super cool and what you should be looking for in a good tool is the ability to create automated workflows. So through this wizard, you could say things like, if I have a confidence score of at least 90% and an attacker risk is high, why don't we just go ahead and automatically block it? Just don't even bother with sending or having to rely on a SOC analyst or something like that to actually go in there and do it. We're just going to automatically block that, generate a ticket, send it to the DevOps and say, hey, um, this is a problem for you to fix that. Right? So again, tenants of the three pillars that we've talked about so far of a good API security tool set. The other tenant, this guy right here, active testing. Okay. Now, in our application that we are offering, what I would tell you is be very careful with active testing. Because what this thing is, is an automated way to absolutely shred any application you call that. So if you have an application that you're developing in staging or in dev areas, you simply define it here and you point it at it. At this point, we will actively scan it if this is no longer passive, and we will attack it as hard as we possibly can to generate these reports that you see down here telling you about the delay behind the discovery, the delay findings, the attack, and all of that. Um, but the reason I say that is because sometimes, and we get this question a lot, I just bought a product from such and such company. Can I turn this on it? Please don't. That could be very bad, especially if that product is in your production environment and we absolutely shred it in pieces. Um, so again, this is intended for use only in your staging environments, pre-production okay, The idea here is that you want to test those applications to make sure that they are solid from an API security standpoint before you promote them to production so that you're not constantly having to worry about your runtime protection on the side. Okay. So these are the tenants you should be looking for all of your um, API protection endeavors, right? Now, it's, a, it's great if you have the appetite to look at all these things at one time. Um, however, again, like I said, the journey starts with discovery, okay? So you need to make sure that whatever you're looking at has a very robust level of discovery so that you can know about what's going on in your environment before trying to actively protect it. So, um, you know, that's, at a very high level, that's the workshop. Now the workshop also goes into things, more things other than the low attacks and stuff like that, right? And it's meant to be, again, highly interactive. Um, so the important takeaway here is that for this particular workshop, like if you want to get your hands
it's an instructor, playing with instructor. Okay, well, I'm doing all that stuff. I'm going to encourage you to reach out to me. Um, and you'll need my contact information. I can set these kinds of environments up for you anytime. Okay? And you log in and poke at it, play with it. I'll walk you through part of it, but it can be so right. And what I mean by that is, like, if I come over to okay. here, this is a handy dandy, not my API security walkthrough, right? Leading you through the first parts of what I just did. Right? So the reason why this is super important is because I can stand this stuff up, we can get your entire team in here. And you guys can poke at it for a week without adding your own time, whatever you want to do, right? Um, which is, you know, super cool. So you get your hands dirty and actually figure out what this thing can be doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, 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 the, that's the high level view of what a good API security tool set um, would, would do for you. So, with that, Question time. Do they have any questions? If you would, please, and you do have a question, step up to the mic there so we can capture. It's okay, you don't have to be shy. I answer all my interim questions. It doesn't have to be about APIs. <laughs> all right, well, fair enough, fair enough. Um, anyway, my name, Steve Rico. Senior Solutions Architect and Engineer with Akamai, specifically API Security. We do have a booth here downstairs in the um, exhibit hall, booth number 725. I would encourage all of you to stop by and say hi. Love to see your faces again. Love to learn a little bit more about you guys and anything else. Um, and so that you can meet the rest of the team, because API Security is just one piece of, of what we do, but um, in my opinion, it's the most important piece. <laughs> so anyway, that's it. That's my time for today. So. Thank you all very much.